All right, we're going to make a shift now and turn in the Gospel of Mark. We're looking at two passages as we continue with our summer series of encounters with Jesus. And then in our series, uh, we've seen Jesus interact with his friends, uh, a blind man, a foolish wedding planner, a sick woman who was embarrassed, uh, a high-ranking Pharisee or religious leader. And today, we have Jesus interacting with children. Jesus has lots of interactions in the Gospels. Why are we talking about kids? We're talking about kids because kids matter to Jesus. Kids matter to you parents, don't they? Especially your own kids and the kids that your kids hang around with. And you know, here at Walnut Creek, kids matter to us as well. Mark 9, and then I'm going to shift to, uh, turn the page and we'll shift to a passage in Mark 10. But both of these have to deal with Jesus interacting with children. And they, the disciples and Jesus, came to Capernaum. And when Jesus was in the house, he asked them, <clears throat> what were you guys discussing along the way? But they kept silent, for on the way they argued with one another about who was the greatest. And he sat down, and he called the twelve, and he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And he took a child and he put him in the midst of them, and taking the child in his arms, he said to him, Whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not me, but him who sent me. A chapter later, Mark 10. And they, parents, were bringing children, even infants, in the parallel passage in Luke 18, to Jesus that he might touch them. And the disciples rebuked the parents. But when Jesus saw it, he was indignant. And he said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for to such belongs the kingdom of God. Truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. And he took them in his arms. And he blessed them, laying his hands on them. Remember when you were a child, or remember with me when we were children, and the extended family or a party happened uh, at your house. Perhaps it was Thanksgiving, or Christmas, or a family reunion. And during the mealtimes, what happened? The adults sat at one table, and the kids sat at the children's table. You remember the kids' table? Did you like the kids' table? My children hated the kids' table. They wanted to be in, included in the conversation around the adults' table. They didn't want to feel like second-class citizens shoved off to the side while the adults, the important people, talked, and they were excluded. It didn't take us very long and for our kids to voice their displeasure until we banished the kids' table. Not only in our home, but in all of our family reunions, we threw everybody together when we ate. Because we thought it best to bless the children by letting them come and engage with the adults. In the first passage that we read, the disciples or followers of Jesus had been bickering with each other over who was the greatest. Who was the closest to Jesus, or who was Jesus' favorite? Who was contributing the most to the group? Who was the smartest? Who had memorized the most verses of the Torah? 
The implication was that the other disciples would have to not just serve Jesus, but serve Jesus' second in command. And after sheepishly confessing to Jesus that, yes, we were arguing over who was the greatest of us, Jesus told them, buddies, friends, if anyone would be first, he must be last and servant of all. We get that. The first shall be last, the last shall be first. If you want to be great, become a servant. But Jesus wanted to make his point and make his point clearly. So he employed a child as an illustration. He took a little one in his arms, propped him on his hips, you know, like the mother hold. And he said to his disciples, look here, whoever receives one child in my name receives me. And whoever receives me receives not just me, but him who sent me. My friends, the heart of Jesus doesn't overlook a lowly child who at the time was marginalized in ancient societies, but he receives and thereby cares for little children. And Jesus is showing the disciples that they should willingly take on lowly, often unnoticed tasks and care for those who have little status in the world. And anyone who does this, Jesus says, receives me, and in doing so also receives the Father, him who sent me. And so humbly caring for people, even a child of lowly status, out of obedience for Christ, he says in my name, will be rewarded with a rich personal relationship with both the Son and the Father. Now you can tell a lot about a person by the way they treat people. I mean, treating the janitor with the same respect as the CEO is a clue into one's character. And Jesus tells us that respectfully treating those with less power and less prestige is how he wants us to act because he is one who left a prestigious position to become a man. He left his father's throne room, seated at the right hand of God the Creator, and lowered himself and became a child who spit up and needed his diaper changed, who cried when he was hungry and tired. And Jesus is saying, receiving the Son of God is equivalent to receiving the Father. Believing the Son of God is believing in God the Father. I once accepted a ministry job where I was to focus on teaching adults and leading the small group ministry. That was the job description I accepted when I accepted this church's offer. There was a little lapse in between um, the, my acceptance and moving up uh, to this place. And um, when we moved our family a few months later to begin this new job, I walk into the office and I am told now that my job description had changed. I was now the pastor to children and youth. Now I have to admit, I was quite disappointed and a bit disillusioned. It felt like a demotion. I went to seminary to become the pastor of children. Why wasn't this discussed beforehand? I felt a bit deceived. And I had a real crisis of faith. I was like, all right, we're here. Moved our family. How am I going to carry on with a good attitude? I mean, we'd already moved, we'd settled down. And a couple passages came to my mind. One in John 8, 42, that says, If God were your father, 
you would love me. That's what Jesus said. He also said in, in John 16, for the lo Father himself loves you because you have loved me. All right, I, I'm getting this relationship. Jesus is saying, if you love me, you love the Father. If you love the Father, then you will love me. And I looked at those verses and reason that Jesus is, you know, he's essentially saying, Steve, if you love me, you love my Father. And by loving me, you are loving the Father. And so I concluded then, and this is what got me through the next few years of my life, that I could show my love to the adults by loving their children well. You know how it is, parents. When someone loves your child well, how grateful you are to them. You're like, thank you. Thank you for being kind. Thank you for investing. Thank you for mentoring. And even when your child comes home from that loving person and says, so-and-so said this, and now they believe it, and you look at your spouse and go, wait a minute, we've told them that every day of their life. Why is it now the light bulb turned on? But yet you're still grateful that that person was saying the same thing you said, and now they got it. You can tell a lot about a person by the way they relate to children. And we see this in the second passage of Mark. The parents were doting. They wanted Jesus to touch and bless their kids. The disciples were what? Dismissive. They wanted to protect Jesus, thinking that the children were a bother to his agenda. And what does Jesus do? He hollers, bring him to me. I mean, it was commonplace for Jews to seek a rabbinic blessing for their children. We see this in the Old Testament all the time. Parents taking their children to the, to the rabbi, to the synagogue, the tabernacle, to be blessed by the priest, the rabbi. That's commonplace. And, and we can surmise that quite a number of cheerful families were standing in line, chatting with babes in arms and children running around playing tag. But folks had, had seen or at least heard of the power of Jesus' touch. And parents wanted this new, compassionate, powerful, healing rabbi to touch and to bless their children. But then it stopped. And outside the house, the disciples were shooing all these parents away with their kids with a rebuke. Why were they doing this? I think they thought that they were protecting Jesus. I mean, they knew Jesus was under pressure. I don't know if you've been watching The Chosen. Uh, you get it in the form of an app. It's not on television, Netflix, Prime, Hulu, whatever. But it is an amazing depiction of the life of Jesus as he's gathering his disciples. We're in season two. One of the episodes really caught me. Jesus, there's a line of people outside a small tent, and they're all coming to see Jesus. Whether to be blessed or forgiven or healed, Jesus is all day out there. And when he's done and it's dark and the disciples are making, some of the disciples are making some food around a fire, Jesus walks by, and it's a man utterly exhausted. He can barely put one foot in front of another. And this, I'm sure that that might have been most of his days. And so the disciples are trying to protect him, make sure that the important people, the people who really need to see Jesus, are being seen by Jesus, but not by these little crumb crunchers and snotty-nosed brats running around. That's a bothersome to them. And these Besides blessing these kids, they didn't need healing. These, there's lame people, there's lepers, there's blind people. They need healing. This is just a blessing. So the disciples, for some reason, chose to stop the flow of the kids and parents being blessed. 
verse 14 indicates that Jesus saw what was happening and he was indignant. It's the only time this word is used in the New Testament about Jesus especially, that he was indignant. It's, it, 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 it's a combination, if you're indignant, it's a combination of hopping mad and very grieved. Okay? I can't believe this is happening. There's a sense of grief, but it's also a sense of anger, like, I can't believe this is happening. This should not be happening. And that's how Jesus was feeling. And he was angry, and he, and he overrules the disciples' decision by saying, let the little children come to me. Hinder them not, for to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. What you talking about, Willis? For to such belongs the kingdom of heaven. Jesus makes an amazing declaration right here. I'm going to get to that. But what does this tell us about Jesus? First, it's obvious. Jesus loves children. He'd been a child himself. He was a real baby child, toddler, teenager, young adult, man. And we see Christ's love for children in the Gospels as he celebrates the delight of a mother on giving birth in John 16. We see the gentle love of a father who cuddles his children in Luke 17. And we see the parental love that listens to every child's request in Matthew 7. And many of Jesus' miracles involved children. The nobleman's little son in John chapter 4. The demonized son of the man at the Mount of Transfiguration in Luke, excuse me, Mark 9. Uh, Jairus' daughter to whom Christ tenderly said, little girl, I say to you, rise. Jesus, as a man and God, loved children. And so we learn from Jesus' indignation first that Jesus loves children, and secondly, that Jesus affirms and respects the personhood and spirituality of children. In saying, for to such belongs the kingdom of God, he's affirming their full spirituality and valuing it as a human being. They are the heart's that he takes to himself. And Christ affirms and proclaims the spiritual capacity of children. Now, since one, anyone, the only way one enters into a relationship with God, we're told in the scripture, is what? By faith. By believing and trusting in him, not by our works, not by our accomplishments. It's for by grace we have been saved through faith. It is not of our works. If that's the case, then even a child can exhibit faith and have a relationship with God. There's no age of accountability in the Bible. It's not that, oh, once they turn seven, now they're held accountable for their actions. It's not until they're 12. Why is that? Because the Bible says in Romans 3 that all have sinned and fall short of God's glory. Children, teenagers, adults, seasoned citizens all come to God by faith and faith alone. Well, that's important because I need to tell you that this is the 50th year I've been a believer in Jesus. I was seven years old. That's right, I'm 57 now. When I knelt beside my bed and I asked Jesus to forgive my sins and be my friend, that's the words I used. In Alexandria, Virginia, at 2112 Sweetbriar Drive, I was in first grade. And Jesus did forgive my sins, and he became my friend even as a kid. And he's continued 
for a half century, forgiving a half century's worth of my sins and being my faithful forever friend in spite of myself. For a half century. Jesus not only elevates children, but he elevates children's faith. He said, truly I say to you, whoever does not receive the kingdom of God like a child shall not enter it. Now, the word translated not is very strong. Sort of like Gandalf. Remember from the Lord of the Rings? The gray wizard turns into the white wizard, emphatically declaring to the Balrog, you cannot pass. I am a servant of the secret fire, wielder of the flame of Anor. The dark flame shall not avail you. Flame of Udun, go back to the shadow. You shall not pass. She's laughing because I was really a bad imitation. I couldn't do a British accent well. Thank you for that. The New Testament scholar William Lane comments, the solemn pronouncement is directed at the disciples but has pertinence for all men and women confronted by the gospel because it speaks of the condition for entrance into the kingdom of God. No one will get into the kingdom of God unless he or she receives God's salvation like a child. No one. So how are we to understand and apply this? For starters, coming as a child does not infer innocence. Any two-year-old dispels that notion. I mean, people, you know, I'm a, okay, so I'm a Reformed Calvinist, and to the T of tulip, right? Total depravity. Not utter depravity, that's different. Total depravity, arguing with folks and debating about are people depraved or are they innocent? I, I've always said that, just look at a two-year-old or go live in a university dorm. You will see the depravity of mankind and womankind come out, no problemo. I never had to teach my kids how to lie. I never sat down after a good dinner and said, now it is time for our lesson in deception, kids. Here's how you deceive people in order to look better and get your way. I never had to teach them that at all. They've never heard me whine. How did they turn on that voice? Where did that come from? So don't think that coming as a child means coming innocently to God. Neither does like a child suggest the wondrous subjective states that we often find uh, in children, such as simplicity or, or wonder, uh, beautiful as they are. What Jesus has in mind is an, ob an objective state that every child who has ever lived, regardless of race or culture or background, has experienced, and that is helpless dependence. Because every single child in the world is completely and absolutely and totally, objectively, subjectively, existentially helpless. We just had Sloan Juniper Resch over last night. Three weeks old. My most beautiful granddaughter. Sloan is helpless. Parenting at that point is keeping the infant alive every day. And if you can keep them alive, you're being a good parent. It's the same for us grandparents. We just get to hand them over a little bit later. Sloan Juniper Rush, as beautiful as she is, is utterly helpless.
And so it is with every child who is born into the kingdom of God. Children of God's kingdom enter it helpless. Ones for whom everything must be done. And the realization that one is helpless as a child naturally fosters what? Especially with us adults. Humility. And Jesus gave reference to this connection when, in a similar but separate statement in Matthew 18, he said, Truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. I mean, how interesting is it that little children are the model of how people enter the kingdom of God? I mean, God bestows his kingdom upon the low, the helpless, those who cannot do anything themselves to gain entrance. Because entrance into a relationship with the Father, into his kingdom, is not something that can be earned or manufactured or reimbursed or gained on the basis of human merit. But let's not miss the fact that our attitude is to be just like those children whom Jesus picked up and blessed. If we are Christ's disciples, we will not claim the kingdom. We will not tr try and force our way into it. We simply have to receive it with the empty hands of faith and trust. And never forget that in this kingdom... There's forgiveness for all your sins. There's forgiveness for divorce. There's forgiveness for addiction. There's forgiveness for adultery. And there's forgiveness for the sin of pride on the part of anyone who says to themselves, well, I've never been addicted, I've never committed adultery, and I've never been divorced. Therefore, I'm superior to those who have. In this kingdom, God freely receives repentant sinners. But he turns away all those who think they've earned their place in his kingdom. So entrance into the kingdom of God is bestowed and received. Entrance can never be earned. We must simply receive the blessings which Jesus gives us as those children who were brought to Jesus revealed in his blessing them. Elton Trueblood, a philosophy professor and a Christian, and became a friend of mine and later of his life. I will tell you that story another time. He said this, Christianity is the religion which challenges the ordinary human standards by holding that the ideal of life is in the spirit of a little child. We tend to glorify adulthood and wisdom and worldly prudence, but the gospel reverses all of this. The gospel says that the inescapable condition of entrance into the divine fellowship is that we turn and become as a little child. Against our natural judgment, we must become tender and full of wonder, unspoiled by the hard skepticism on which we so often pride ourselves. When our, my kids, our kids were young, I used to play a game with them. Standing at the bottom of a staircase, they would go up a few stairs and, um, and I would go one, two, three, and I'd snap my fingers, and they would jump. And they would jump into my arms. And as they got braver and got a little older, they would go up another stair, and, and then they, I'd go one, two, three, snap my fingers, and they would jump, and I would catch them. Now, some of you know my kids. Some of them are more naturally braver than others. All my kids were brave. In this matter, they kept going higher and higher and higher. Of course, then you know there's Emily. She's halfway up the staircase, just. Ah! She wasn't afraid of anything. 
But why would they keep doing it? Oh, we laughed. It was fun. But wh- I mean, this was far better than any trust fall you do at a team building exercise at work. I mean, this was the, this was the leap of faith. I mean, they got way high on their stairway. They could barely clear the last step. I had to be ready to catch them. And then they got bigger and bigger, and it got harder and harder on the old man. But why did they keep doing it? Why was it so much fun? Was it just because it made them all laugh and gave them a little thrill of victory? It's because they trusted Dad. They trusted that Dad was still strong enough, still coordinated enough, still loved them enough to catch them. Jesus is saying to us today, now unless you grown-ups are willing to recognize that you need to come into the kingdom of God like helpless, humble, and trusting children, you can't enter. Jesus, remember when Jonathan was preaching on Nicodemus? Jesus said the same thing. He even went a step farther with Nicodemus. He told him, unless you are born again, you will never enter the kingdom of God. It's not that you just need to be a a, a child who's trusting enough to jump into uh, your father's arms. You need to be a helpless baby who just poops and eats and spits up. That's how you enter the kingdom of God. That utterly helpless and dependent on your heavenly Father's care of you. My friends, are you ready to put away your adult pride and your self-sufficiency and one, two, three, leap into your Father's arms? Are you willing to say, I got nothing. Um, I'm ready to trust you. Are you willing to lay aside your sense of accomplishment and merit and simply trust in Jesus? I want to let you know he's ready to receive you. That's what John said in the beginning of his gospel. But to all who did receive him, who believed in Jesus' name, he gave the right to become what? Children of God. Isn't that ironic? You have to come into the kingdom like a child, and then when you get there, guess what you're called? A child. But you have found your forever family. Because now you're adopted by God. And he promises that you are co-heirs with Jesus. And he grants you eternal life. In closing, do you remember the old song, some of you maybe who grew up in the church and went to vacation Bible school, Jesus loves the little children, all the children of the world, right? Red and yellow, black and white, they are precious in his sight. Jesus loves the little children of the world, every color, every race. All are covered by his grace. Jesus loves, Jesus lived, Jesus died, and Jesus rose for all the children of the world. Are you willing to be called a child and become a child of God? Let's pray. Lord Jesus, it's... um, It is a stretch. It's a bit humiliating to say, after all I've done, after all I've learned, after all I've worked hard for, nothing in my hand I bring simply to your cross I cling. May we trust you. Some of us are going to take that leap into your arms today, perhaps for the first time. Some of us have been jumping for years. And it seems as we've gotten older, we've gone higher and higher on the staircase, and the stakes are even higher. Help us not to doubt you. 
Your righteous right arm will protect. You are mighty to save. You will catch us every time. May we trust you in this way. In your name we pray. Amen.